Good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this globe. Welcome again to another episode of The Journey Planner. This is the podcast, the video cast, the vlog, if you want to call it that, where we share pointers, where we share ideas, where we bring on people who are in the trenches, as it were, who are on their journey or have completed the journey from the city to the country. And these individuals, many of them can and will share ideas that would encourage us, that will stimulate us, that will help us, and that will support us on our journey. We are, we have lined up for you a rip-roaring rip show again for you with Brother Thoptin Th Th Puri, Robert Thoptin Puri. And if you're thinking that sounds Asian, you're very right. We will hear more from him in a little bit. But as usual, we want to kick off our show with a word of prayer. So wherever you are, whatever you're doing, if you can pause reverently and let us pray. If you're driving, please keep your eyes on the road, the hands on the wheel, and you can join in thoughtfully as we pray. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, again we have come to share, to broadcast, um, again, ideas, experiences, testimonies, encouragement to anyone who has thought of, who is on the journey, or who have even completed the journey from the city to the country. We pray that you would give us insights, discernment, encouragement, and you will show us the way wherein we can walk in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, I have good news and bad news for you. I don't know which one you want first. Um, the bad news is that this is our last show. This is our last episode for the year. I didn't say it's our last episode. I'm saying that this is going to be the last program um, for the show, for the journey plan for the year. We are going to kick off again next year on January the 6th. On January the 6th, we will start the New Year programming. And we have been going quite strong. We have over a year and a half, maybe a year and three quarters, 
of um, broadcasts that we have done. And this is going to be the last one for this current 2023. In 2024, we will start again on January the 6th. So please remember, put those dates in your calendar, in your diary, whether it's a digital or physical one, so that you can join us again in the new year. Just want to remind you that you could find us on the internet, on the interweb, thejourneyplan.co.uk. We also have social media platforms like um, YouTube, and I think that's The Journey Planner, Facebook, The Journey Planner SDA. If you just Google us, you will find us. You will find our webpage again at thejourneyplanner.co.uk. Uk. You can find many, if not all, of our past episodes either on YouTube and on our website. With that said, we want to lift off by introducing to you Brother Robert. Initially, Brother Robert is from the continent of Asia, and he has been in the UK for quite some time. And as young as he is, he has taken early retirement and moved to the country of South Wales. And I am going to ask him to come and share a very thought-provoking, very serious um, topic, the prophetic clock and country living. Tying these two things, these two concepts, these two ideas um, is a very serious matter. And I want you to keep your ears peeled, take notes if you have to, and you can again repeat and um, listen to the broadcast. I also want you to share the link with someone that you think would um, benefit from this broadcast. The link, hold on, let me just see if I could pop it in the chat. If not, I'll just have to ask Dell to do it. Um, I'll give you, is that the bottom of the screen? Okay, so you just, Share that out to anyone and let them know that we are again on the air, on the internet, on the interweb, broadcasting and sharing ideas that is of relevance to people who are moving from the city to the country. But most of all, I want to remind you that it is not just moving to the country for country's sake. <laughs> this is part of not just a physical journey here on earth, but from the journey, the journey from here to the heavenly Canaan, from here to the heavenly Canaan. So brother Robert, I want to welcome you to our platform. I hope this is not going to be the last time we're going to have you, but we want you to feel comfortable, feel welcome. I want you to share what God has put on your heart, give us the testimony that you have. And you know, afterwards we will ask you a couple of questions and then we'll wrap up. Is that okay? Thank you very much, Brother Hilton. You're most welcome. All right, take it away, and um, I'll be taking some notes, and we'll see you at yeah. the end of your presentation. Yes. Thank you again. So if you want to hear my full testimony, there are two-part testimony on the journey planner. And I would recommend look at that because, because uh, it has been a real journey. Uh, we had to step out in faith because by God's grace, since 2015, the Lord has put in my heart and in my plate, I have to say rather, to go and do evangelism. So I've been doing evangelism uh, far and wide by God's grace, uh, predominantly with uh, non-Adventists, uh, predominantly with Christians and also with other uh, uh, faiths as well. But um, the journey is there on the YouTube, you can check on Journey Planner. There are two episodes um, of my testimony. But just wanted to say that it was a step of faith. We did not know where we are going. We did not know how we'll survive. If we'll quit our jobs, we did not know nothing. Mm. We just stepped out in faith, knowing that the Lord is leading and he will take care. And I'm telling you, two and a half years. Old. The last date I was working was November 30. 2020. Since then, I'm not working. But um, if I have not eaten, that is because uh, of my choice of not eating. I have a roof over my head, food on my table, abundant of clothes and food and everything else, and uh, um, nothing lacking. If I needed any money, 
I never, uh, I have to say this as a testimony before I begin. I never ask man. I don't even ask God. I, I just plan and do it. And before I need the money, the money is already there the day before. I've learned this before I could even quit my job. So we have to practice trusting in this father who is richest in houses and lands. We know all of this in theory, but a lot of times we don't apply it real time. That is the problem with lots of people. And this is what I face every time I talk to people about it's time to move to the country. People are afraid. They want to know this detail and that detail. If you know this detail and that detail, you don't have faith. Sorry, I'm very straight and open. You don't have faith. Period. There's no discussion about it. People need to trust the Lord, follow his commandments and statutes in their life, and you see the blessing. It is amazing. So let us go to today's topic that I'm asked to present. I'm asked to present what is called as um, the prophetic clock and country living. Why do we need to move to the country? So where need we need to understand where we are in time in terms of what God has revealed to us as prophecy. And that is important. And if that is not understood, we will never understand what God is trying to show to us today. So here we are trying to just examine what God wants us to know. So I want to say that we are living in the last days we are living in the last days and i believe let me say this i believe jesus will come in my lifetime i'm 62 years of age i will not die of old age if death comes that is god's plan for me and i will take that joyfully because the next thing i see will jesus and that's very soon if death doesn't come otherwise i will walk into heaven by god's grace that is my desire and I'm praying and hoping that that will happen. So I want to set the stage by saying that. So let us understand what God is trying to show to us as a people in this time and age. So we're looking at final events of Bible prophecy. I just want to read some quotes for you. And to set the stage with the text, 2 Peter 1.12, where it simply says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established, in the present truth. The present truth has been eternal, but a present truth for every single time of life on planet Earth. God, God has present truth. And the present truth for us today is Jesus coming again. So now it says here in last day, when let the watchmen now lift up their voice and give the message which is present truth for this time. Let us show the people where we are in prophetic history. And that's what I want to look at. Revelation 12, 17 highlights a very key text. Revelation 12 is the juiced version of what we like to call the great controversy began before the creation of man. And the last verse, 17 says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Simply, which is the spirit of prophecy, if you concur in Revelation 19, 10. So who is this? No other denomination, which is 45,000 plus Christian denomination exists today, which are recognized and listed. Nobody can claim this except the remnant, which is called Seventh-day Adventist. So what we need to understand is very important. So if you look at the uh, prophetic times, there is Ellen G. White, who was identified as a gathering prophet. We'll touch this as we go through. So now there's a secret, secret, serious things happening in the world today. There is war that happened from October 7, 2023 in Israel with the Hamas. And it's very interesting. There are so many details I can go into for want of time. I'm not going to the details of what's happening around the world because they're not literally milestones that God has given. We're going to go through the milestones that God has revealed to us in his word. But I want to set a stage to remember. The world today is talking about Israel becoming his chosen generation again. There is a secret rapture doctrine and seven years of tribulation doctrine that every single Christian out there believes. Every single Christian. There's going to be a secret rapture, they say, and seven years of tribulation taking Daniel 9.27 and splitting up the 70 weeks prophecy the last week and throwing it in the future. This was created by the Jesuits in Rome to take away the stigma of the Antichrist from papal Rome 
to sometime in the distant future and that doesn't exist now. So that's what is happening right now. And what are they saying? Jerusalem will come up, temple will be rebuilt and uh, sacrifice will start again. That simply means Jesus Christ, he's coming to this earth, his first advent, his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, he's thrown out of the window. The devil is making this counterfeit for the second coming of Jesus Christ just when we are at the cusp of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Serious things are happening now. And I have a three-part presentation on this itself, Secret Rapture and Seven Years Tribulation. It's on our website, prophecylife.org website. It will be launched. Three episodes are recorded. They will be launched on our website. You can check them out. Prophecylife.org YouTube channel. You can check Secret Rapture and the Seven Years of Tribulation three-part episode. So now, let's look at what God is revealing in the Bible to us. Here we have this chart. We're going to go through this chart today and understand the prophetic time events that God has revealed to us. And these are the sequence of events that will happen as revealed to us in His Word. And we have dates on the left-hand corner because those dates have been fulfilled to the letter and to the date. We don't have dates from the icon where it says we are here, that's the time period we are living in the prophetic chart that God has given us. We don't have dates because God has not given dates and times. So we only have the events. But this chart is not measured time to scale. It is because it had to be described and written down. It looks large. But these events will happen so quick that Ellen White says that it will come as an overwhelming surprise, meaning so rapid they will be. So let's understand this chart in essence. So now, just to set the stage again, many do not understand eschatology. Even I did not many years ago. Great Controversy 598 says, The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented, but multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. Satan watches to catch away every impression that would make them wise unto salvation and the time of trouble will find them unready. Serious thoughts for us to consider. So now in the chart, you see this section here with dates. We're going to examine this section with dates. There are small columns which we are not actually describing, but I want to touch them. The first small column you will see under the base as papal rule time period, you would see 1755. 1755, Lisbon earthquake. Everybody knows this. Lisbon earthquake hit Portugal and in the capital, Lisbon. Why was that? Lisbon was the headquarters of the Inquisition. So when the earthquake hit, it destroyed a lot of uh, the um, city itself. Once the quakes subsided, fire came and destroyed a lot more. And when the fire stopped, then the, what came? A tsunami came and destroyed the rest. Threefold destruction came, came on this. And when did it happen? On the All Saints Day when everybody was gathered in Lisbon. God's punishment happened there. That's 1755. This is the signs that Jesus gave. This is the uh, signs that you would see during the um, prophetic events that God has revealed in the book of Revelation. And then the next date is uh, 1780, which is called the dark day, where the sun was darkened and the moon was darkened on the same day in the night. And then you have 1798, where the papal rule comes to an end, meaning the prophecy of the 1260 days or years comes to an end when Emperor Napoleon sends his general birth year and takes Pope Pius VI captive and he dies in captivity. Meaning state power of papacy comes to around. This is described in Revelation 13, 3 as receiving a deadly wound. That's what happened. Okay. And then what else happens? Then you see another small column there, which says 1833. This is when stars fell like literally rain. And in fact, it lightened up the sky so much so that people could read newspapers in midnight because of the stars falling. And that also is according to how God prophesied will happen and then you come to the time period of 1840 1840 is the time period when the sixth trumpet is blown august 11 1840 when the ottoman empire comes to an end these are all prophetic events that are god has revealed to us that revelation 11 verse 15 you would see that happen there sorry and then you go on to see then you have the first angel's message second angel's message being proclaimed so this is the time of the end since 1798 
you would see that Daniel 12, 4, 8, and 10 tells that knowledge will increase. Men shall run to and fro. The book of Daniel is unsealed. People began to understand. Now, great controversy. 356 says, but since 1798, the book of Daniel has been unsealed. Knowledge of the prophecies has increased, and many have proclaimed the solemn message of judgment is near. This is what happened. So, the proclamation of the three angels' messages began. From 1840 to 1844, Great Controversy 611 says, The Advent movement of 1840-44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every missionary station in the world and in some countries where there was the greatest religious interest which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. So first angel's message started proclaiming. And then the second angel's message, remember the first angel's message is found in Revelation 14, 6 and 7. And the second angel's message is found in Revelation 14, verse 8. Now here in Great Controversy 603, it says this scripture points forward to the time when the announcement of the fall of Babylon as made by the second angel of Revelation 14 is to be repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the various organizations that constitute Babylon since the message was first given in the summer of 1844. So second angel's message began proclaiming in 1844 in the summer. Then we have what is called the Midnight Cry. Now, Midnight Cry happened from 1844, summer to fall. So while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. That's quoting Matthew 25, 1 to 15. In the summer of 1844, midway between the time when it had been first thought that the 2,300 days would end and the autumn of the same year was proclaimed in the very words of Scripture. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. That's from Great Controversy 398. Now, the third angel's message began proclaiming since 1844 and will be proclaimed till probation closes, which will be the end of time. So when the third angel's message closes, mercy no longer pleads for the guilty inhabitants of the earth. And the people of God have accomplished their work. They have received the later rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord and they are presented by the tying hours before them and angels are hasting to and fro in heaven. That's a great controversy 6, 1, 3. Yeah. So the next event that we have in the next column is 1844. 1844. There are a few things that happened around this time. So we'll just highlight some of them. Here you would see Jesus moved from the holy to the most holy. Now this is exactly on that date, October 22, 1844, that is the event that happened. It is called the Great Disappointment. Today in history, identified as the Great Disappointment. Now, this is the time the first vision was given to Hiram Edson in the sanctuary, that Jesus in the sanctuary, on October 23, 1844, when he was walking through the cornfields. There were two of them walking. And it was an amazing experience. He, Hiram had some, got excited and went around behind and talked to his brethren. And 50 of them got together. And they understood Jesus moved from the holy to the most holy. And the beginning of the investigative judgment came. The end of the 2300 year prophecy begins. And now, eventually, the 50 group studied together, understood. And therefore, they knew that now judgment began. And the three angels' message has come to be proclaimed. And the start of the remnant church begins of Revelation 12, 17. In fact, this whole movement is found in Revelation chapter 10. God has revealed in Revelation chapter 10. The Millerite movement is described there. October 22, 1844 is Revelation 10 and verse 10. And after that, there is only one verse in Revelation 10, which simply says, prophesy again unto many people's kinder tongue and nations. So that is the birthing of this remnant group called the Seven Dead Adventists, which is very prominent and emphatic to finish the work. And we are asked to prophesy again Jesus is coming. And when this movement actually formed as a church on 21st May 1863, and they gave the name Seventh Day Adventist. And what else happened? Few days later, on the 5th June, from 21st, few days, that's hardly three weeks, 
less than three weeks. 5th June 1863, the first vision after the formation of Seventh-day Adventism, God's vision was health reform. Unfortunately, this has been trampled. I talk about papers trampling the sanctuary and articles of the sanctuary. Seventh day Adventists too trampled upon something. They trampled upon the health reform, and we continue to eat according to Leviticus 11. We never came to Daniel, therefore, I never understood Daniel, never understood Revelation, were never reformed in our lives, and the gospel did not go. Four generations have gone by since 1863 to 2023 is 160 years according to the bible 40 years is one generation four generations have gone by because we have not accepted the very first message that was given to us as god's remnant people help subsequently came there and was presenting at that 1888 righteousness by faith and was rejected god's people were not ready are God's people ready today? The harvest is plenty, reapers are few. Jesus said that 2,000 years ago. It has been multiplied 2,000 times. In 1889, a Sunday law would have been passed. A.T. Jones was sent to the U.S. Congress, and he debated single-handedly against so many of those people who were arguing against him. It's called the Buckridge Bill. It's also called the Blair Bill. And I've done a series of lengthy presentations on this as well on prophecylife.org. If you want to check it out, you can check it out. It's simply talking about the Sunday law crisis and the series of 10 to 12 presentations are there on what has happened in that time period. So the time periods in Daniel 12 is a big confusion. We are looking at the prophetic law. There are so many people who have taken these time periods and gone off in different tangents, making up various doctrines from Daniel chapter 12. Now, remember in Revelation chapter 10, verse 6, I'll read that first. It says, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and earth and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things that are therein, that there should be time no more. No time anymore, meaning no more time prophecies. So all the time prophecies that you can think of or the time periods explained in the book of Daniel have to end on or before 1844. I'm not reading the verses on the left. You can read it. It's all there on YouTube if you want on the recording. That's Daniel 12, verse 7, Daniel 12, 11, and 12. Serious things are resting considered. So now have attempted to make these time periods literal time in the future, but Revelation 10 6 precludes this possibility. So this time periods had to end in 1844 at the very latest. So the 1260 time period that is found in the book of Daniel the 1,290 and the 1,335 days are mentioned. Now, the 1,260 begins in 538 AD and ends in 1798. The 1,290 days begin in 508 AD and end in 1798 AD. You need to know why 508 AD. We have a study on this as well. If you look at the rays of the CB's papal room, if you look at our presentation of Prophecy Live, we have explained what happened in 508 AD for this time period that God has revealed. It is when the papal road receives the insignia and the other um, memorials that memorials that were given to begin the papal papacy receiving power of statehood. It was a process. It did not simply happen in 7, 538 AD. It started in 508 AD. In 538 AD, the last tribe, the last. Uh, Little uh, the horn that was uprooted, Ostrogoths were destroyed with the help of Justinian, and state power was now fully given. It started in 508 AD. So all these time periods end in that time. So the 1335 days begin in 508 AD and end in 1843. Serious things for us to consider. We're looking at the prophetic clock. So this 2300 day prophecy is a very complex prophecy. I'm not going to explain it. It is all there. You can take a screenshot if you want, or you can do your research if you want. You can look at this. In fact, I have an eight-part series on simply the 70 weeks and the 2,300-day prophecy. By God's grace, it will go live eventually next year. So the event number three that we have, they have another date again there. It's called 1929. 1929 is when the wound began to heal. The deadly wound was received in 1798 to papal Rome when state power was taken out. In 1929, what happens? Benito Mussolini, premier of Italy, 
representing King Victor Emmanuel III and Petro Cardinal Gasparri, Papal Secretary of State, representing Pope Pius XI, signed the Latin Treaty on 11th February 1929, meaning state power given back to Papal Rome. So now they are a state, they are a country, and they can rule as like every other country that exists on planet Earth. That's what happened. This is what is referred to in Revelation 13.3 as the wound healed. So that's what is happening. So now in this prophetic time clock or period chart that God has given, we are here. We are here in this time where we are living. It's simply the time period of counter-reformation among Christianity. This is called the shaking time or the shifting time. This is what is happening now. This is the beginning time of that time period. And eventually, it's going to escalate the shaking and shifting. So this is where the time when the wheat and the tares are going to be identified. How will they identify? Jesus himself said, by their fruits, ye shall know them. And this is the time period that the proclamation of the three angels' message will happen, especially the third angel's message. Now, this is the time period the Counterfeit reformation will happen. This is the time period where you have to preach the gospel to every nation. Matthew 24, 14. Remember Jesus when he was on this earth in Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20. He gave a commission. Go therefore and teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Son and Holy Ghost. And teaching them to observe all things. Lo, I am with you always even unto the end of the world. That was the commission he gave 2023 years ago. When he was on this earth. Now. How much time has gone? Almost 2000 years gone. Now what is the commission for the last days? Matthew 24, 14, we live in a world of top up. Everything is top up. You top up this, you top up that and everything else. So today, commission two is top up. There's nothing new under the sun. Whatever you talk about on planet Earth is in the Bible. The principles are in the Bible. The top up commission is in Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel shall be preached to a witness unto all the world and then shall the end come. Meaning the top up is people need to see the Lord. Witness. You cannot do whatever you want to do and say and try to preach the gospel. No, people need to see something different, meaning people need to see Jesus in the one who's talking about Jesus. So we need to replicate God's character in our life. And we need to study the word to prepare for the final crisis. In fact, this is high time that people leave the cities and move to the country, led by the God. So every single person who believes that Jesus is coming and knows and understand the great controversy of Revelation church chapter 12, 13, 14, and want to proclaim and be part of the people who are going to be sealed and walk into heaven without seeing death, have to prepare. Not only spiritually, physically. Moving out of the cities into the country. Why should we move out? Why should we move out? Let's have a look. By the way, let me show this first. On the left side, that's my house where I'm speaking from. The first window on the left was where I was sitting initially. That's our hall. And right now I'm sitting on the last end in the bedroom. That's the second bedroom. It's a two-bedroom cottage. I'm sitting in the last window. That's where I'm sitting and talk talking right now. God has given us this place for his name and his glory. He gave it on a platter when we stepped out in faith. We were homeless for a period of time. We were jobless for a period of time. We did not know what was going to happen, whether we we're going to remain homeless, whether we we're going to remain jobless. We don't know. But God was good. The day we left our jobs, the day we left our house, God gave us money, so much money from our pension, from the NHS and from the little mortgage that we could get from the property. So much money he said, I am covering your backs. You go. When we left our house, we were homeless, but God gave us money and the assurance that we, he is with us. So here, let's look at this. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. I can tell you countless things that's happening around the world today. In fact, in the UK, the deputy prime minister on December 5th, that's a couple of days ago, they announced that there's going to be serious trouble. Get some candles, get this. Is get batteries and things like that. This was said by the deputy prime minister in the United Kingdom. There are so many things that are happening in the world. I don't even know if you'll understand what's happening. They wanted to have a, a serious crisis from 2023 to 2025. What is that? Cyber pandemic. World Economic Forum, the Great Reset has already started. 
after the pandemic. Pandemic was declared end in the, I think, March or May this year, 2023. And they said the Great Reset has to start after the pandemic ends. And, and part of the Great Reset is cyber pandemic, meaning suddenly hacking, shutting down of systems. Have they happened? Yes, they have been happening. And the target is still 2025. 2025, they want to make the whole world digital. If that happens, human beings on planet Earth are finished. Let me drink some water, excuse me. In cases where we are brought before the courts, we are to give up our rights unless it brings us in coalition with God. It is not our rights we are pleading for, but God's right to our service. I'm telling you, 2025 is going to be probably the beginning. I'm not God. I'm not a prophet. But I can discern by God's grace prophetic things. 2025, I believe, will be the starting point of Revelation 13, 15, 16, and 17, where people will be prevented from buying and selling. We'll talk about that in this presentation a little bit. So it's high time to leave the cities. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies are signal for the flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of the power on the part of our nation, that is the USA, in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities, preparatory to leaving the smaller ones of retired homes in the secluded places among the mountains. Taken from Testimonies, Volume 5, 464 and 465. Now, 2025. I don't know how many of you know, there's something called Project 25 in America. They have come up with a program of whoever becomes the president after the elections that is coming up in 2024. At the end, you would see that the ones from January 1, they have to implement that Project 25. In that, they had made a document of 920 pages. And in that document, 539 page, it talks about the Sabbath and the conditions of work. I'm telling you, serious things are happening. So... Paul also describes this in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. Look at Pope sitting there on his white throne. According to the Bible, Revelation 20, verse 11, talks that God's throne, white throne. And Pope sits on a white throne, and God's throne in the book of Revelation identifies two cherubims on either side. Look at how the Pope is sitting. Serious things for us to consider. Matthew 24, 15 to 16 tells us we need to move to the country. When he therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. It was for then, it's also for now. Serious things for us to consider. Why also need to move out of the cities? Why again? Second point to highlight. Satan is going to target to destroy the cities. Isaiah 14, 16, and 17 says this. They that see thee the shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake the kingdoms? Verse 17 says, And made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that, that opened not the house of his prisoners. I'm telling you, it's coming. Not only Satan, God too is going to bring destruction on cities. Look at this. Here, we are looking at the judgments of God coming on the cities. I put three quotes highlighting it. It says, the end is near, and every city is to be turned upside down every way. There will be a confusion in every city. Everything that can be shaken is to be shaken, and we do not know what will come next. The judgments will be according to the wickedness of the people and the light of truth that they have had. Oh, that God's people had a sense of the impending destruction of thousands of cities now almost given to idolatry. The time is near when large cities will be swept away and all should be warned of this coming judgments. And here am I trying to do that by God's grace. Now, the pen of inspiration, Ellen White also describes so many things. These are a few quotes just highlighting the points that are highlighted there. It simply says, get out of the cities as soon as possible. Read Revelation 11 and 18 chapters. I'm telling you, we are living in Revelation. 11 verse 45 sorry 44 where it says tidings from the east and tidings from the west trouble him meaning the king of the north which in that verse is papacy and he goes to destroy many tidings from the east is revelations chapter 7 1 to 4 where the east the angel from the east is coming with the seal of the god meaning sabbath and uh, the second coming tidings from the north is jesus coming from the north isaiah 14 12 to 14, you can see Lucifer wanted to sit on the sides of the north on the 
king on the stars of heaven. So second coming and the Sabbath, meaning the seal of God, are going to trouble papacy and he's going to destroy many. Revelation 11 verse 14. It is time for us as churches. God as far as possible from the cities. Go as far as possible from the cities. Do not consider it a burden to leave. The Sunday parting is strengthening itself. By beholding nature will be changed into the image of God. Time is not far distant when we need to flee to the mountains. So we, some people have not even moved to the countryside. Time to flee to the mountain also is coming here once the time of trouble comes. Matthew 24 21 to 22 talks about the time of trouble will be shortened for the elect's sake. Otherwise, all flesh will be killed. That's what Jesus is telling. Few people get together and support each other. That's the admonition given. I would recommend read the book Country Living. It's a small booklet. You can sit down and read it in one shot. If you're serious. If you're not serious, you wouldn't bother. Don't even pick it up if you're not serious. Forget it. I'm very straight in telling you what to do. The next event is called the Sunday Law. In God's prophetic time clock. The Sunday law is when the little time of trouble starts. Satan in this time period counterfeits Jesus and his second coming. Satan's angels will personify the dead as come back to life from the dead. Mark of the beast will be received. Seal of God will be received. The loud cry will happen later in. All of these things are going to happen in this time period of the Sunday law. Let's briefly look at them as we look at it. So now here is the simple thing for us as those who are seven Adventists. The straight testimony will produce a shaking. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and are shown that it would be the cause of the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will raise up against it and... This will cause a shaking among God's people. I'm telling you, this is my experience in some places. The Lord calls for a renewal in the straight testimony born in the years past. He calls for a renewal of spiritual life. The spiritual energies of his people have long been torpid, but there is to be a resurrection from apparent death. By prayer and confession of sin, we must clear the king's highway. Serious words of admonition for us. So now we are here today in Bible prophecy. Early writings 263 says, We must examine well the foundation of our hope, for we shall have to give a reason for it from the scriptures. This delusion is spread, and we shall have to contend with it face to face. And unless we are prepared for it, we shall be ensnared and overcome. But if we do what we can on our part to be ready for the conflict that is just before us, God will do his part. And his all-arm, all-powerful arm will protect us. He would sooner send every angel out of glory to the relief of faithful souls and to make a hedge about them than have them deceived and led away by the living, sorry, lying wonders of Satan. We are living in this time today. Now let's briefly look the events from the National Sunday Law or the from that time period to the close of probation. What will happen? What God has revealed to us. The, we're living in the time of shaking. So this is the time period for the final shaking. Separation of the wheat and tares leaving a whole wheat church. And in the final shaking, the wheat and the tares will be separated. Early writings, 118. I then saw the third angel said my accompanying angel. Fearful is his work, awful is his mission. He is the angel that is to select the wheat from the tares and seal or bind the wheat from the heavenly garner. These things should engross the whole mind and the whole attention. There's going to be a sealing. Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characteristics have one spot or one stain upon them. Serious things. Another thing to happen is the latter rain. It is left to us to remedy the defects in our character to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples in the day of Pentecost loud cry has to happen Revelation 18.4 says and I heard another voice from heaven saying come out of her my people that ye be not partakers of her sins that ye receive not of her plagues it's going to happen the other sheep John 10.66 says this is the time when the other sheep were who are not of this world will join God's remnant church. It simply says, Other sheep have I who will hear my voice, them I shall bring, and there shall be one fold and seven shepherd. That's John 10, 16. 
So we have a work to do. I already quoted Matthew 24, 14. People need the Lord. People need to see the Lord. Only then they will listen to us. Martyrs will be there eventually. As the Protestant churches reject the clear scriptural arguments in the defense of God's law, they will long to silence those whose faith they cannot overthrow by the Bible. The dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe, persuade or compel all classes to honor the Sunday. The lack of divine authority will be supplied by oppressive enactments. Serious things for us to consider. The judgment of the living is going to happen. In 1844, judgment began with the dead. But between the National Sunday Law and the close of probation, there will be a judgment of those who are living. So God raised up his church after the great disappointment in 1844, according to Revelation 12, 17 and Revelation 10, 1, sorry, 11. There's going to be a church triumphant eventually. The church militant is not the church triumphant. The church militant must wrestle and toil. She must strive against temptations and fight severe battles because Satan is not dead. His agencies are much more active in this work than are the agencies of God in the work of their leader. Can you look at this statement? Seriously. So, there are going to be two great errors that God has revealed through the book Great Controversy by Ellen White. Through the great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under these deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp the hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling in the rights of conscience. So, we're going to highlight two things. One is the last act in the drama and another thing is called the crowning act in the drama. So in the last drama of the great controversy is called the Sunday law. The substitution of the laws of men for the law of God, the exaltation by merely human authority as Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama. When this substitution becomes universal, God will reveal himself in his rare eyes, in his majesty to shake the terribly the earth. He will come out of his people to punish Sorry, of his place to punish the inhabitants of the world for their iniquity and the earth shall dissolve her blood and shall no, sorry, disclose her blood and no, and shall no more cover her slain. That is happening when Jesus comes. Seriously, we need to consider. So what is the timing of the Sunday law? Jesus gave the signs in Matthew 24. Today we live in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes and diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. That's what it says in verse 8. Now all these have been happening with since 2000 years ago, since Jesus said it. But they're happening now with, with intensity, with rapidity. In fact, all at the same time. Verse 9 says, And then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And he shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now, the last act in this will be the Sunday law. Verse 10, and then shall be offended and many sh and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Now, this is going to happen during the Sunday law time period. Brother, sister, father, mother, relatives, church members, other Christians, non-believers, etc., whoever. Verse 11 says, in this scenario, in what we call a little time of trouble, all these things are going to happen. After the passing of the Sunday law, so to say. Verse 11 says, many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. There are far too many already so-called prophets in this world. Verse 12 says, and because of any ticket shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That's already be building up right now. Can we see that today in believers as well as non-believers? We can leave the non-believers outside. What about believers? What about church members? We go to the same church. Some people don't even talk to each other. Verse 13 says, but he that shall endure on to the end, the same shall be saved. All this is the little time of trouble which is knocking at the door. Now the Sunday law will come in four stages if you read the pen of inspiration. Meaning I'm quoting the reference of Ellen White's writings. Refrain from work on Sunday. Or second stage would be honor Sunday but can still worship on Sabbath. Third stage would be cannot worship on Sabbath but only Sunday. Fines and imprisonment will be imposed. Finally, the fourth stage, death penalty to those who worship Sabbath and disregard Sunday. We'll briefly touch all of them. First stage, check out the Green Sabbath project that's happening all around for many years now. Every single facet of humanity is on it. Churches, students, young, old, atheists, you name it. One day a week, do nothing every week. 
And what day are they pushing? Sunday. Take a weekly day of rest, make it a real Sabbath for you and for the earth. Pope Francis pushing it. Don't drive, don't shop, don't build. That's why they're pushing. So what to do when this crisis comes? First stage. The question was asked to Ellen White and she answers. I will try to answer a question as to what you should do in the case of Sunday laws being enforced. The light given me with the Lord at the time when we were expecting just a crisis as you seem to be approaching. Remember 1889, Sunday law was almost passed in Congress in the United States. God stopped it because people were not ready. So as was the time when the people were moved by a power from beneath to enforce Sunday observance, Seventh-day Adventists were to show their wisdom by refraining from their ordinary work on that day, meaning Sunday, and devoting it to missionary effort. That's the advice given to us when this first stage comes in. So do not defy the Sunday law as yet, because it does not come in between you and your God. To defy the Sunday laws will be to strengthen in their persecution the religious zealots who are seeking to enforce them. Give them no occasion to call you lawbreakers. If they are left to rein up men who fear neither God nor man, the reining up will soon lean its nullity for them. And they will see that it is not consistent that nor convenient for them to be strict in regard to the observance of Sunday. Keep right on with your missionary work with your Bibles in your hands, and the enemy will see that he has worsted his own cause. One does not receive the mark of the beast because he shows that he realizes the wisdom of keeping the peace by refraining from work on that gives offense, doing at the same time a work of the highest importance. Remember, you can still keep the Sabbath holy on this day. Try and keep Sunday also holy. There's no harm making every day holy. If you Break the seventh day Sabbath, that's when you sin. That is the advice given to us. Stage two comes in. Now there's a law to honor and worship on Sunday. There's a law for Sunday. But can still observe Sabbath, nothing against Sabbath yet on the seventh day. Social pressure increases and little time of trouble slowly begins. And this is the time period many seventh day Adventists will compromise. Now, here in Great Contrast 608, it says, As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through the obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking with spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuations, stir up the rulers against them. Can you see what's written? Seriously. If you look at the Gospel of Jesus and the Gospel of Babylon, it is shocking. I'll just leave that for now. We need to remember that the false religion is unable to change the world. So the state it needs to enforce a law to change the people of the world. That's what is going to happen. So stage three is going to come. The law prohibits worship on Sabbath now. Can only worship on Sunday. Now fines and imprisonments will be imposed because of those who keep on the Sabbath. Now the time period of you cannot buy, cannot sell is going to come. Based on Daniel 11.43 and Revelation 13 verse 17. So as the controversy extends into new fields and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, Satan is astir. The power attending the message will only madden those who oppose it. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light lest it should shine upon their flocks. By every means at their command, they will be endeavors sub suppress and discussion of these vital questions. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power and in this work, papists and Protestants unite. As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against commandment keepers. Very clearly revealed to us. Now the faithful cannot buy or sell anymore in this third phase. They will be threatened with fines and imprisonment and some will be offered positions of influence and others rewards and advantages as inducements to renounce their faith. But their steadfast answer is, sure from the word of God, our error, 
the same plea that was made by Luther under similar circumstances. Those who are aligned before the courts make a strong vindication of the truth and some who hear them are led to take the stand to keep all the commandments of God. Thus, light will be brought before thousands who otherwise would know nothing of these truths. What an experience will that be? So, then finally the stage 4 comes where they are going to pass a death degree based on Revelation 13, 15 to 17, Daniel 11, 44 to 45. Probation closes. Time of Jacob troubles begins and Satan personates Christ. These are the things that will happen in this fourth stage period. Fearful is the issue of to which the world is to be brought. The powers of earth uniting to war against the commandments of God will decree that all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, shall conform to the customs of the church by the observance of the false Sabbath. All who refuse compliance will be visited with civil penalties and it will finally be declared that they are deserving death. On the other hand, the law of God enjoining the Creator's rest day demands obedience and threatens wrath against all who transgress its precepts. A choice will have to be made by all humanity on planet Earth and by this time. By choice or by force, which one you will want to choose? So who will receive the mark of the beast? In this time period, people will receive either the seal of God or the mark of the beast. Let's identify first who will receive the mark of the beast. Then we'll identify who will receive the seal of God. So with the issue thus clearly brought before him, whoever shall trample upon God's law to obey human enactment receives the mark of the beast. He accepts the sign of allegiance to the power which he chooses to obey instead of God. And the warning from heaven is, quoting Revelation 9, 10 and 11, Sorry, 9 and 10. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive the image mark in his forehead or in his right hand, the shame shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Taken from Great Contrary 604. So seal of God is the Sabbath, seventh day. Mark of the beast is Sunday, first day of the week. Simply to put it point blank. So, now remember, Sabbath existed in eternity and will exist till eternity. I put a few texts here. You can seriously understand those texts. We have not written them out. The Sabbath was hallowed at creation as ordained for man and it had its origin when? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. That's Job 38.7. That is before the creation of man. Peace brooded over the world, over the earth, was in harmony with heaven. In Genesis 1.31, And God saw everything that he was made, and behold, it was very good, and he rested in the joy of his completed work. Now that is when he created it for man. Because he had rested upon the Sabbath, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, set it apart as to a holy use. He gave it to Adam as a day of rest, and it was a memorial of the work of creation and thus a sign of God's power and his love. So the scripture says, He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered, and the things that are made declared, the things invisible of him, since the creation of the world, even his everlasting power and divinity. So, Sunday law, we talked about it. That is the last act in the drama. Now Ellen White writes in uh, Maranatha 376 that this is the crowning act. After the last act, there's a crowning act, meaning Satan coming as Christ. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of our hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in Revelation. That's Revelation 1, 13 to 15. Read that description and understand. Satan is going to come like that. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything the mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout for triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come. Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in a adoration before him while he lifts his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon this earth. His voice is soft and subdued yet full of melody. Remember he's the choir master in heaven before he fell down. The gentle compassionate tones he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people and then in his assumed character of Christ he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. Can you see what is going to happen? 
This is what Satan is going to do. He's going to strengthen the people to say, I changed the day of Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. He's coming like Jesus. Remember that. So, what is the timing of Jesus, Satan coming as Jesus? Matthew 24, Jesus listed it. 14, the gospel goes to the whole world. That is finally culminating in the loud cry and the close of probation. Matthew 24, 14. Now, 21, 22, I already quoted. This will be leading to the time of trouble. Where you also get the seven last plagues. All these things are going to be short. And the time of trouble is going to shorten. It's not given as seven years of tribulation. A lot of people say there is no Bible, scripture, evidence of any seven years of trouble in this nation in the Bible. Christianity is deceived out there. That is why people who know the Bible, people of the book, need to tell the people who don't know their book. There is no seven years. It only says shortened time period here. And for then shall the great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there shall should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So, verse 23, this is where Satan appears. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. This is when Satan is appearing now and during the little time of period, just before the great time of period, time of trouble. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Meaning miracles were going to be performed. Supposedly dead are going to be raised. Nobody is going to be raised. Satan's angels are going to impersonate the supposed dead people coming back to life. So, how will he deceive? There are so many religions in the world. I picked up few religions here, four religions. In fact, five religions. Jews are waiting for the Messiah to come. The coming of the Messiah was a basic Judaism outlined in the 12th of the 13 articles of faith. So now the Jews rejoice. Long awaited Messiah has finally arrived as they have been expecting a powerful king who will end the Messianic wars. Muslims are waiting for Mahdi to come. The Quran refers to the Christ's second coming in chapter 4, 159, known as the Mahdi, the 12th in the line of Imams. So he comes as a majestic being of dazzling brightness to the Islamic world in the way that the Mahdi is expected. What about Hindus? Hindus are waiting for Kalki to come. The god Vishnu incarnates himself whenever, his, whenever evil prevails. Uh, Kalki, who will finally appear in the clouds and destroy all evildoers in an apocalyptic battle to initiate a thousand year reign of peace on the earth. This is exactly what is being taught today in Christianity. Jesus is going to come in thousand years reign from the throne of David in Jerusalem. He arrives among the Hindus and will, who will see him as Kalki and the final and climatic incarnation of Vishnu. Buddhists are waiting for Matriya to come. The last Buddha called Matriya, son of love, is expected to appear from heaven and bring great spiritual blessings. So Buddhists are now seeing Matriya come to bestow blessings upon mankind. Christians are confused about the second coming. Ever since Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly, Christians have been anticipating his return. Christians disagree on when, where, how, and what will he do when he does come. That's why secret rapture, seven years tribulation, everybody is going to get a second chance to go and the whole world will go. That's what they believe today. I would recommend read the book, Great Controversy, 6 to 4. All of this context is given there in its details. So now two common factors among religions. The world's greatest religions have two, at least two important similarities that could become factors in Satan's grand deception. Number one, all expected divine personage to usher in an era of peace. Number two, all have discord within their own faith about the nature of his coming. Satan is going to exploit it. So the book Great Controversy describes the as prior to the second coming, quoting Revelation 12, 12, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, and that the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knows that he had but a short time. So she places this verse in the last days, saying, fearful are the scenes, she writes, which call forth this exclamation from the heavenly voice, and the wrath of Satan increases as his time grows short, and his work of deceit and destruction will reach its culmination in the time of trouble. Serious things for us to consider. Meaning Satan will deceive all humanity. A lot of Remember there are a lot of atheists and communists. What about them? Also, if a divine personage, a false Jesus, Kalki, Matriya, 
Mahadi, whoever it be, it doesn't matter which appeareth on earth. It wouldn't take long for millions of communists to realize how unreal socialist realism is and everyone else, be it atheist, agnostic, or whoever. Now, Satan impersonating Christ speaks deep truths, heals the sick, meaning he brings disease and cures it, and performs other miracles. Spiritualism is going to be at its peak and the second great terror besides the Sunday sacredness. So then because the world is suffering in a terrible time of trouble, he tells the non-Christians that to help end the woes, they all should have a common day Sunday to worship God. In this strong, almost overmasting delusion, he makes the same appeal to the Christian world, claiming to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday. I'm telling you, great deception is coming, even in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. From selected messages and last day events, 156, it says, We have far more to fear from within than from without. The hindrances to, to strengthen and success are far greater from the church itself than from the world. Unbelievers have a right to expect that those who profess to be keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus will do more than any other class to promote and honor by their constant, consistent lives, by their godly example and their active influence, the cause which they represent. But how often have the professed advocates of truth proved the greatest obstacle to its advancement? The unbelief indulged, the doubts expressed, the darkness cherished, encouraged the presence of evil angels and opened the way for the accomplishment of Satan's devices. So what is needed? Need the seal of God. What does it mean? The Sabbath. What does it mean? Fourth commandment. Obedience to the commandments of men instead of the commandments of God will be an abomination in the sight of God. For what God requires is essential to the highest good of his subjects. And this is therefore essential for the glory of God. What is the seal of God? Sabbath is the seal of God. The word Sabbath in Hebrew language is simply meaning this. AB means father. B means dwelling. ATH means sign. So if you Put them together, father, dwelling, sign. That's what Sabbath means. So if you keep the seventh day Sabbath, meaning the father, God the father, is dwelling with you. God's seal contains three things. We're looking at the Sabbath commandment, meaning the fourth commandment. It has the name, title, and territory. Name is the Lord thy God. Title is creator, territory, heaven, and earth. This is the seal of God. So who will not have the seal of God in this final privileged generation? I'm saying this generation on planet Earth is the final privileged generation. They can walk into heaven without seeing death. If so, God will. So the seal of God will never be placed on those who commit such abominations. Loving the world above God. Abomination of hypocrisy. Obeying man rather than God. Turning away from God's law, following falsehood, false doctrines, and soul-destroying heresies. Just there are just five. There are more that you can pick up. So Sabbath is the Lord's day. Everybody knows this from the Bible. And everybody can say this from the Bible. But the problem is everybody says this is Old Testament and for the Jews. That is the problem. But God is saying Sabbath of the Lord. My Sabbath. My holy day. That is not being looked at carefully. That is the problem. If you look at planetary movements, just to understand this a little bit. If you want to tell other people what is God's plan. If you examine the cycles of time marked on earth, determined in astronomy by God, according to Genesis 1.14, the Bible says that the 24-hour day begins at sunset and ends at sunset. The Genesis 1. So 12 hours darkness, that is night, sunset to sunrise, and 12 hours light, meaning day, sunrise to sunset. John 11, 9 in Genesis 1, 1 to 31, you can see that. Now remember, one day is found with the earth revolving on its own axis. One month is found with the moon revolving around the earth. And one year is found with the earth revolving around the sun. Those are the three formations that God put in planetary movements. But a week is not put in planetary movements. The measurement of a week can be only traced back to God's creation of six. Six days work, seventh day Sabbath rest in the account of Genesis 1 and Genesis 1, 2, 2 as well. Serious things for us to consider. And eventually calendars came. First the lunar solar calendar was followed. And then calendars began to come into existence. Another in history, 
in 55 BC, Julian calendar came, one of the prominent calendars. There were other calendars too, but I'm picking up some important calendars. Julian calendar comes where they give the names based on the goddesses. In fact, planets and planet goddesses. Those are the names Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So that was how the names came for the week based on goddesses of planets. And then you have another calendar change in 1582 by Gregory the 13th. He tried to alter some days, but the week never changed. First day was Sunday, seventh day was Saturday. And then you have finally another calendar that exists today. I'm just whizzing through history of calendars. According to the ISO number 8601, in the year 2004, this calendar was ratified and made permanent. See the change now in the calendar. Monday is the first day of the week. So which is the seventh day of the week? Sunday. You can see this in calendars, in digital gadgets, everywhere. Can you see the deception that God is bringing? One final question I want to ask is this, on the context of the Sabbath, the seal of God. There are so many countries in the world that have only one language. In English, we have two terms for the seventh day. One is Saturday. One is also called biblically Sabbath. In most languages, in a lot of countries, 180 plus countries in the world, they have only one term. The seventh day is called Sabbath, period. People need to understand what it is. Sunday, is. it says the mark of papacy is authority. Sunday is our mark of authority and the Roman church is about the Bible and this transference of the Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. So simple things to put us, and I want to highlight one important point here. The Catholic Church admits the Seventh-day Adventists are keeping the true Sabbath of the Lord. Now, this is from the question book of the Catholic Universe Bulletin. It says, the Catholic Church changed the observance of the Sabbath to Sunday by right of the divine infallible authority given to her by her founder, Jesus Christ. That's what they say. The Protestant claiming the Bible to be the only God of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, the Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. Serious things to consider. Now, when everybody made the decision after hearing these messages, probation closes. Final decisions have been made. God's people are sealed. Satan's people have the mark of the beast. God's spirit, Holy Spirit, is fully withdrawn. Now, Jesus leaves the most holy place, takes off his priestly garments, put on his kingly garments. Plagues begin to fall. Now, Remember this little time of trouble, eschatology. America will bring up God's remnant. Those who have the seal of God. Keep this in mind. Revelation 13, 15 to 17. The little time of trouble. We need to understand these two periods in the context of country living and fleeing to the mountains. A lot of confusion remains there between country living and fleeing to the mountains. There are two separate phases. They are not one phase. Revelation 13, 15 to 17 says, And he had power to give unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause them that as many should not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused them both small and great, rich and poor, free and bought to receive the mark in his right hand or in his forehead. And no man shall, might buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. This is called the little time of trouble. When the Sunday law will start, which is knocking at the door. And I believe... Um, by God's grace, it's going to happen soon. Get ready, get ready, get ready. That's what is needed. Now, we need to remember the great time of trouble. And this will be for those who have the mark of the beast. Only. Daniel 12 was 1. And at the time shall Michael stand up. I mean, judgment is over. Jesus stands up. Great prince shall stand up for the children of the people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, Thy people shall be delivered for everyone that shall be found written in the book. Now, let's find the difference. If you look at this chart, there is no starting time for the little time of trouble. It would eventually start when the law is passed. There is no starting time. There is no ending time. The ending will only be when Jesus comes and when the plague starts. So the little time of trouble time period is when country living is needed, meaning when the Sunday law comes. When the law comes to no buy, no sell, when the Sunday law comes, you cannot buy and sell, you cannot move. While everybody is waiting for this and that to happen, seven-day Adventists are waiting for Sunday law. 
to think of moving. You will not be able to move. I'm telling you. You read the book Country Living. You read Testimony. You read the last events. You will not be able to move when the Sunday law comes. And this is the time period to move. God has given us a window. The door is closed. Window is still open. That's serious we are living in. Grow your own food and sustain yourself. By God's grace, we are growing our own food. I show you the pictures. You can look at our testimonies. When the great time of trouble comes, meaning the seven last plagues, that is when you flee to the mountains. That is when bread and water God provides. Some people say, oh, my water and bread is short. Foolishness. People don't understand Bible prophecy. Your bread and water is not sure if you don't do according to God's bidding, according to his plan. Very serious things for human beings to understand and comprehend. When the seven last plagues come, this is after the close of probation. The seven plagues is called the great time of trouble. Second death degree will happen, but this time no one will die. Because there's a sealed probation close, no more death of God's people. They're living righteous, the 144,000, they're identified it. I believe this is a symbolic number. I believe there are lots more than that. And people will be there and no death will happen now. This is called the Jacob's time of trouble. So first plague is painful source. This is the only way anybody who will ever know whether they have the seal of God or they have the mark of the beast. But there is no hope when this happens. Probation is closed. Judgment is over. Jesus stands up. So. First plague, painful source, no cure. Second plague, the seas and oceans clot. There will be a stench. Ellen Weiss describes about this. Because all living in the sea will die. Ships will stop. Everything will stop in the sea. Third plague, fresh water turns to blood. In fact, if you read this in Revelation chapter 16, it said, you killed my blood. You shed my people's blood. So now drink blood. This is going to happen to the wicked who have the mark of the beast. And then you have the fourth plague, scorching sun. Remember, these are top-up plagues. We live in the era of top-up as we near Jesus coming. Not like the plagues in Egypt. One came and Pharaoh asked Moses to ask God to take it out. God took it out. Another came. God took it out. Another came. God took it No, no, no. These are top-ups. Read Revelation chapter 16. You will notice the first plague and the second plague. Add on, add on, add on till the seventh plague time period. Scorching sun painful source is going to only make excruciating pain and then you see the next fifth plague is darkness not only spiritual darkness there's going to be physical darkness too darkness brings extreme biting cold which increases the pain more than the heat these are serious things to think about whether you want to have the seal of god or the mark of the beast sixth plague three unclean spirits like frog talking of the dragon the beast and the false prophet and again now miracles will be being performed by satan and his agents trying to still deceive people thinking they have hope but they will be exposed in this time period that is what the drying of euphrates and all of that talks about that's a different story altogether you, if you want to know in details you can go to our website prophecylight.org seven last plagues and understand in detail all of this so finally the seventh plague hailstone and um, uh, earthquakes and great earthquake as never before and all of this happening rocks will be flying here and there people will be asking rocks to fall on them at the end of the seventh plague jesus comes at the end of the seventh plague jesus comes the jokes have stopped cursing lying lips are now silent in the middle of their terror the wicked hear the voice of god's people joyfully exclaiming lo this is our god we have waited for him and he will save us so at the end of the time of trouble, great time of trouble. Second coming happens at the end of the seventh plague towards the culmination. At this time, there's going to be a special resurrection. Bear with me. I'll finish in a few more moments. There is going to be a special resurrection. The wicked turn on the beast and the false prophet invite Alan Wright says that they will be killed because of the wrath of the people of their deception and being deceived. God God announces now his second coming. His people, righteous dead, are raised. 144,000 vindicate God's character. Wicked perish from the final events of God's glory. Righteous are taken to heaven for a thousand years. These are the events that will happen. I want to highlight something very important about a special resurrection. Now, the special resurrection is mentioned for two classes of people. Those who crucified Jesus and the righteous seven-day Adventists who died. 
under the proclamation of the third angel's message. Now, this is from Great Controversy, page 637 and 640. It says, graves are open and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. That's Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. So all who have died in the faith of the third angel's message come forth from the tomb glorified to hear God's covenant of peace with those who have kept his law and they also which pierced stem. Two groups are going to raise in a special resurrection. Why? We'll talk about it. Revelation 1 talks about the second group. Those that have mocked and derided Christ's dying agonies and the most violent oppressors of truth and his people people are raised to behold him in his glory and see the honor placed upon the loyal and the obedient. Now there are some events. I highlighted four events but there are more events if you read the book written by Ellen White. Events between the special resurrection and general resurrection. There are some things. There's a special group. The Ellen White says all those who died in the third angel's message will raise. You can see that blessing pronounced in Revelation 14 and verse 13. Blessed are they who die henceforth. That's the blessing pronounced. They will have a special resurrection because they have gone through this time period of the great trouble. And what happens of the three angels' message being proclaimed? So they hear God the Father announce the day and hour of Jesus coming. God the Father announces it. Because Matthew 24, 36 says, no one knows the day and hour. So God the Father now announces it and all those who are alive, they are raised in the special resurrection. Those who crucify Jesus Christ, who are they be, and the 144,000, whoever they be, will hear this. And another thing, now the Ten Commandments are displayed in the sky for everyone to see. So all the wicked who survived the seven last plagues and all those who resurrected in the special resurrection will see this. The general resurrection has not happened yet. Remember this. And the third thing they will see is the cloud of the size of a fist coming from the east. Closer and closer becomes white. And then you see the chariots of fire. Jesus comes close to the earth. He doesn't set foot on the earth. That's what happens. And finally, Jesus now calls the righteous dead to rise. So all these things God the Father was doing. The first two things God the Father shows. And finally, Jesus now comes and the last trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ raises. These are the events that will happen between the general special resurrection and the general resurrection. So what will happen when the people go with heaven, with Jesus to heaven? Will educating many saved who don't know Bible truths during this thousand years? A millennium. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you seem to have been um, a temporary interruption with Robert's internet connection. I'm not too sure if he's going to be able to rejoin us soon. However, uh, we have had quite a bit of information, power packed information there. And, um, and, and, you know, my mind is blown. It takes me back to the time when I was growing up back in the Caribbean when prophecies were um, studied and explained in great detail. We don't, uh, you know, I, I, it's very few, seldom and far that we hear such exposition of the um, prophecies that are going to happen. And I quite like, um, and I was quite intrigued and interested in the way and how he placed the movement of the people, us people from the city to the country in terms of the, the prophetic timeline. All right, Robert is back with us. Let's just... Brother Robert, are you there? Apologies, I got kicked out. I don't know what happened there. Yeah, uh, we, we're not too sure, but um, yeah, we've got to have you back. Can you continue where you left off? And um, sure. I'll finish yeah. off quickly by yes. God. Yeah, just give me a minute.
I need to share screen, please. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can. Well, I think Sister Gabriel might be um might be able to give you a sharing. Okay, good. Thank you. This is how sometimes the devil works. He doesn't want people to know the truth, but uh, we praise God. God is greater than, greater is he that is in the world than, sorry, that is in me than that is in the world. Man. And that's the promise we have. So we praise God for that. So let's continue where we left off and we finish soon by God's grace. So here we are. Millennium, we're looking at the millennium. That's where um, Satan is going to be judged and all those who don't make books are going to be opened and this is going to be the most blessed experience that human beings can ever happen. So, this is where the phase two of judgment. If you want to understand judgment, you can again go and check our prophecylife.org website. We have a topic of the three-phase judgment. Who will be judged? Revelation 24 talks about the judgment will be for all those who are reigning with Jesus Christ, will sit on thrones and judge the whole world, Satan and all. So, after that millennium, there is so many things that will happen in the millennium. Um, uh, you can understand that if you look at that uh, presentation. But here, after the millennium, the holy city comes down. The wicked are raised from the dead. Wicked surround the holy city. Eternal fire destroys the wicked. And the earth is purified and recreated. So that is the phase three of the judgment. The investigative judgment began October 2024. That's the first phase. This is the third phase now. Jesus comes. And every person who has ever lived will stand before God in this judgment. Now, all the wicked who died will be raised. This is the most amazing scene on planet Earth ever. Because every single person that is born since God created Adam till the last one born on planet Earth will be present in this scene. What an amazing experience will it be. But we thank God that um, God has given us this understanding. And before him shall gather all nations and he shall separate them one from another. So finally, I want to conclude an important thing to show you. God has revealed us his time frame. 6,000 years of work on planet Earth. If you remember, the Bible very clearly says that one day is a thousand years for God. So these are six days literally for God. And the seventh day is with him in heaven. Meaning 1,000 years, one day, 1,000 years. Those are from Adam to Abraham, 2,000 years. From Abraham to Lord Jesus Christ coming to this earth, another 2,000 years. And then another 2,000 years have come to an end when Jesus is supposed to come. Let's examine this briefly. From if you do the ages in the Bible, beginning with Adam, and then uh, the kings that ruled and their time periods and so on and so forth. You can look at literally when God, from the time God created Adam till Jesus Christ, you can get the dates. It's um, shocking and amazing. And this is the study. And those are the numbers. So if you calculate those and to that Jesus came, when Jesus came to this earth, 2023, we are living in today. 2000 years have passed by. Jesus came to this earth. Some people say 3 BC. Some people say 4 BC. He was born on this earth. And so many other things. I'll touch you another context. So if you look at those things, 6,000 years have passed. 6,000 years have passed. So let's look at uh, a world's timeline. We're not setting dates here. We're not setting dates here. We're just trying to tell we're at the end of the history of this world and Jesus is about to come. Now, Great Controversy 5 and 8, Ellen White talks. In fact, Ellen White quotes about uh, this 6,000 years three times. The great controversy between Christ and Satan that has been carried forward for nearly 6,000 years is soon to close. And the wicked one redoubles his efforts to defeat the work of Christ in man's behalf. and to no, I had no. Somebody need to mute, mute, please. So if you do simple mathematics, a lot of uh, historians say creation happened in 4004 BC. And today is 2024. No, I... Please mute no, yourself. I... 
Hello. Somebody please mute yourself. Your child is making noise. If you do simple mathematics, you can see 4004 BC to today. That is 6027 years if you simply do mathematics. 6027 years have passed. But let's look at another quote from Great Quantity 328. With the great sacrifice upon offered upon Calvary ended the system of offerings which for 4,000 years had pointed forward to the Lamb of God. So if you say 4,000 years to the cross from creation, then what would happen? 4,000 years, 4,004 BC to, to 31 AD is 4,000. So 31 AD plus 2,000 is 2031, meaning Jesus will come in 2031. So some people are preaching, I'm telling you, some people are preaching Jesus is coming in 2027. Some people are preaching Jesus is coming 2031. When God has said no one knows the day and hour and when God has said time shall be no more. Serious things for us to consider. And some people are preaching based on this seven feasts of the type to the anti-type. They're very true and they're very literal. The type meets anti-type. We are living in the time period of the sixth feast, the Day of Atonement. The seventh feast has to happen. We need to act now, understanding the times. Time is short. Whether Jesus is going to come in 27 or 31 or before or after, we don't know. But he's going to come and soon and very soon. Now, I want to close with this story. We need to act when we are warned. Now, this is May 18, 1980s. An eruption happened on Mount St. Helens in Washington State. Warnings were given that this is going to erupt. Rumblings were heard. People heard the rumblings. Majority left, but one man called Harry or Truman lived near this Mount St. Helens, an active volcano in the state of Washington, and was the owner and caretaker of Mount Helens St. Lodge at Spirit Lake near the base of the mountain. Now, Truman came to fame as a folk hero in the months leading up to the volcano's eruption in 1980 after refusing to leave his home despite evacuation orders. Despite the orders, he remained there. So, Truman was killed by the proselytic flow that overtook his lodge and buried the site under 150 feet of volcanic debris. So what is left there today? Remember what he said when he was warned. Truman said, I don't have any idea whether the mountain will blow, he said, but I don't believe it to be the point that I'm going to pack up and move. That's what he said. In fact, in his own words, it means like this. The mountain is a mile away and the mountain ain't gonna hurt me, boy. That's an American slang way of expressing. Today, on the right is the picture. A tombstone is there because everybody knew he didn't want to move. What do you do? Get into the ark. I would recommend. The ark of safety for today for God's people is moved to the countryside. How shall we stand in the day of reckoning if we don't do this? Now, while our great high priest is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become the perfect in Christ. Not even by a thought could our uh, Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation. Satan finds in human hearts some point where he can gain a foothold. Some sinful desire is cherished by means of which his temptations assert his power. But Christ declared of himself, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. That's John 14, 30. Satan could find nothing in the Son of God that would enable him to gain the victory. He had kept his father's commandments and there was no sin in him that Satan could use to his advantage. This is the condition in which those who be found shall stand in the time of trouble. If we have not attained this, we will not understand the move that needs to be made to the country and prepare for the time of trouble. I would recommend first examine ourselves spiritually. Are we ready? If you are spiritually ready, you will see that you need to be physically ready and you will move. That is my admonition to all of us. Jesus is waiting upon his people to make the choices 
and to be an example to the world and proclaim the great controversy of the third angel's message, which is going to come. The Sunday law, the time of trouble, the close of probation and Jesus coming. I hope and pray that we'll be encouraged to understand this, apply in our lives and do what is right and set an example and herald this message to the world for people to understand. May God be with you all and thank you. Well, thank you very much, Brother Robert. I was, um, you know, I've been taking copious notes. <laughs> um, I, I probably would have to ask you for that PowerPoint presentation because I wasn't able to keep up with the flow of information and the download of information that you've given us, particularly with the prophetic timeline and what is transpiring and how we fit in the great scheme of what's transpiring and what is to happen. Um, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, my comrade, my friends, the time is now if you want to ask any questions, if you want to make any comments, if you want to clarify any confusion that you may have had. I know that we've gotten a lot of information. This is like encyclopedic size information that we have gotten. So do you have any question, comments, or confusion? Um, for clarity. I, I, I would like to say that I've never really had a fully understanding of uh, the little time of trouble and the great time of trouble. That, that for me, was something that I've never thought about. I've never really understood clearly um, little time of trouble versus the great time of trouble. Another bit of information that was also quite interesting to me and virtually new to me is the difference between moving to the country and fleeing to the mountain. Um, again, that I never thought about. I'm now understanding from what you've shared. There are a lot of confusion in the world today, Brother brother um, Robert, like you just identified. And, and even amongst our ranks, there are people who have all different concepts and different ideas. Um, and I have a quick question for you. I'm not even, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, that there are some people who have this concept of the, the Sabbath, um, not in terms of the days, you know, because you've quite rightly pointed out that the enemy of souls, the secular world, the... Um, the, the the Catholic the Catholic system the, um, they 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 are doing different reckoning, but there has come on stream a number of people who are Sabbatarians who are proposing and promulgating the concept of the lunar Sabbath. Have you come across this? And if so, what are your thoughts on it? I did not research so much into it, but I heard about it over the lunar Sabbath. Um, it is biblical in the biblical times that uh, it was followed, and uh, these are the so some of the sea feasts and ceremonies that they had to do in those days, and they come out among all those uh, ceremonies that uh, and the sabbaths, so to say, that have been nailed to the cross. Colossians chapter two verses thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen is the confusion about. The ceremony, the Sabbaths that are nailed to the cross. And a uh, lot of people talk about the seventh day Sabbath, meaning the fourth commandment nailed to the cross. But it is those lunar Sabbaths and the other feast Sabbaths that existed that were nailed to the cross. Mm. So I don't know exactly what they believe so much on the lunar Sabbaths and what they practice today. But it is biblical. Yes, it is there in the Old Testament. Okay, well, thank you. All right, we're just waiting for anyone who has a question. You can either unmute yourself now and ask a question, make a comment, try to get some clarity of any confusion that you've had. Um, and I know that we've gotten a lot of information. And um, Brother Robert, I don't know if you know that you speak very fast. <laughs> uh, I have to cover a lot of ground. I know I speak so, fast, yes. but I have to cover a lot of ground, otherwise it will take two hours. Yes. Yeah, so yes. Yeah, so we we are we. What I'm asking is, 
in order for those of us who um who can't keep up with um this kind of encyclopedia of mind that you have do you have some place i know you mentioned the website several times where we can go and get information that we can absorb in our own time and at our sure. own pace sure what i do by god's grace is um uh, we have started a website uh, um in fact let me just briefly say in my testimonies that i did on journey planner I talked about God sending me to do evangelism and I've been to a lot of countries by God's grace, 36 countries by God's grace. And uh, in the last, uh, from 2015, I've been doing seminars for non-Adventist pastors and non-Adventists predominantly. So that is why I, we, when the lockdown came, I could not go anymore. So we, my friend uh, said, why don't you do one series in one Washington? And online, we did online and then and we came up with this the holy spirit led us okay why don't you do this persistently because you're shut down you're not going anywhere so we started this by god's grace prophecylife.org okay. and uh, by god's grace there are at least 180 plus or 90 presentations and what okay. i'm impressed to do is to put the powerpoint presentations condensed into pdf format because the powerpoint in itself is too bulky and to upload, it takes too much space. So we convert it into a PDF and the PowerPoint is uploaded as a PDF on the page itself. So, so you have a YouTube link if you want to listen to the message, which will be fast like this. <laughs> because again, that's all the presentations have loads of information. So it will be fast as well. So if you want to listen while doing something, you can listen to it or you can download the P PowerPoint in PDF. And then you can, uh, if you want to use it, you can reconvert it back to PowerPoint and modify, edit, or whatever. Is this is this the website? That is it. Oh, okay. So you have I'll... to click on the study section. If you click on the study section. The study section. Study, study yeah. On this the, one? There, yeah, click that one. So those are the topics there listed there. Okay. Wow. So, That's pro very prolific. Yeah, I said, the, and uh, there's also a extra information for every single topic in another PDF. So you, if you click on the YouTube, you can listen to it. If you click on the first uh, section, that will be the PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. Yeah. So okay. we started on the 25th of April, 2020. And uh, every, every week, we upload a message by God's grace. Right. Yeah, so they're all topic based. You can pick on the topics. You click, click on the link. It'll open a, the PowerPoint for you. Mm. Oh, okay. Just if you click on the YouTube, it'll open the YouTube channel for that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So this is the PDF. That right. is the PDF. All right. It's downloaded. Let's get back there. You have to click on the YouTube if you want to see YouTube. Yeah, click on the YouTube. And it takes us to the YouTube. It takes channel. us to the YouTube, and then you can listen to the message. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to close that out because yeah. just to let people know. Oh, hold on. Yeah. Let me stop sharing. Good. Yeah. So it's Prophecy Live. P-R-O-O. -O. I probably should have put it in the, um, in the chat. I'm going to just pop it in the, the link in the chat. For those of you who would um who would like to go to brother mark's page and study at your own time and space are there any questions any um any confusion any comments i like no questions oh okay um, can you give us a summary, brother um, Robert? Can you? Can, I know that you can't summarize everything that you've. But if you were to give people three main points that they need to take away and action, what would be your top three points? It depends on whom I'm talking to. If I'm talking to Adventists, it's a different context. If I'm talking to Christians, 
Christians, it's a different context, meaning non-Adventist Christians. If I'm talking to different religion, everything is contextual. Okay, let's take the Adventists first. Okay, so if you're talking about Adventists, what we would want to tell to an Adventist in these last days is simply this. God raised seven Adventists and seven Adventists birthing is Revelation chapter 10, verse 11. And then in the scheme of the great controversy, the only people identified as seven Adventists is Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon is brought with the woman, went to make war with the remnant of her seed, who keep the commandments of God and the testament of Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, 10 identifies the testament of Jesus Christ as the spirit of prophecy. And those who will enter heaven, the conclusion of the whole matter is Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. It simply says, Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and enter into the city. So these are the characteristics that we need to have. And the message that God has given us is Revelation 14, 1 to 3. And Ellen White says the first angel's message, Revelation 14, 6 and 7. And I heard another angel flying in the midst of heaven. You know, we, we know that. We should know these things by heart. If you want to reach out to people, it should just come out by God's grace. And so it's. she says this message is the call to get back to state of Edenic state. So in the way that God created Adam and what he told him to do is what we have to do. That is country living. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. God is calling us back to country living. He created Adam and he said, this is the garden. You are meant to tend it and take care of it and have dominion over it. The beast of the land and everything else. God wants us to get back to that state first because the hour of his judgment has begun and worship the creator God. That's the first angel's message. And those who don't get back to that state and I want to emphasize very clearly to seven dead man disease, you also have to go to the Edenic state of diet. It's complete. It's mm -hmm. a complete package. Not bits and pieces. You have to go back to the Edenic, the one who created heaven and earth and all that in them there is. You have to go to that. And only when that experience is there, Aaron White says that you would be able to now boldly like Daniel Shadrach, Meshach, and everybody goes stand and say, Babylon is fallen. Second angel's message. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, when I speak to Edwin, as I said, the first angel's message of Revelation 14, 6 and 7 is Daniel chapter 1. That's the fulfillment. And then the Daniel chapter 2 is the second angel's message. Babylon is fallen. And then the third angel's message, Ellen White says, after you have lived the first angel's message, you proclaim the second angel's message. And when the third angel's message time period comes, you will stand. Daniel chapter 3. If you don't have this process, you will not stand. And Ellen White says, not one in hundred, quoting seven dead men, Okay, not one in hundred is preparing for Jesus coming. Wow. That is the shocking thing. Only then you can claim Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Remember, it says faith of Jesus, not faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say in a nutshell to seven Adventists. You know, you must you must have spoken about it in the former um, in the former episodes that you appeared here on the Journey Planner, but I think it would be um, worth repeating to those people who probably um, they they hear this, but they don't know where to start or how to start, or they may not have had the calling that you have. Um, it sounds to me that you had a very distinct and direct calling on your life. Um, By God's and, grace, yes. Uh, so, so that again? By God's grace, yes. Yes. Um, and so there are some amongst us and um, amongst ourselves here who may not have had that experience. They want to, 
but they don't have the clarity or the type of faith that you seem to have. I, I, I could probably make, you know, say that you're probably one of the modern day Pauls. Oh, well. <laughs> now let's, let's not go there. I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm doing my little bit that the Lord has given me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you, you, how would you suggest it's, that it's, they go forward? It's interesting, it's interesting that you said that. I had a small experience like Paul, what I like to say, my own road to Damascus experience. Yeah. Three days. It was also a three days experience. <laughs> that's that's when I had to make a U-turn in my experience, even though I was not living in sin. I'm a third generation, seven advantage by God's grace. But I was doing the normal cycle of life that we as Adventists do. You understand what I mean? Six days shall yes. I labor and do all the work, seven days Sabbath of the Lord thy God. You know that commandment? Yes. That, that lifestyle. God had to give me a big rap, serious rap, and I had to turn around. <laughs> yeah, so that's my experience. Sorry, you were saying something. No, I, I was just asking you to, to help anybody who's in that stage or state of either malaise, of confusion, of not knowing how to start. You yourself, I think you alluded to many people that you speak to who want to make sure that they have the house, they have everything ready, all the docks line up, all the lights are green, um, that they could move and transit smoothly from city to country. Yeah, we need to test our God. Mm. When I was growing in faith, to have 100% faith in God is a process. It just does not happen. You have to grow in faith. And I grew in faith by God's grace. I tested my God sometimes. In fact, I, I put him to test, like how some of the people in the Bible put him to test. One of the most thing comes to my mind is Gideon, for example. How do I, you, I know that you're going to be with me? He said, okay, I want the fleece to be wet. Only the fleece to be wet. Even that was even worse. Okay, I want the whole area to be wet. Fleece to be dry. No, fleece to be wet. All area to be dry. All of those things. I did that. I, I, I'm serious. God is still the same God. The God of Gideon, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. We, we, we know all of these things. He's the same God. The God of Daniel. In fact, uh, my faith increased when I was studying the book of Daniel and Daniel chapter 1. I'm telling you, that is my serious turning point. That was not the road to Damascus. That's a different uh, experience in 2000. This is 2006. Serious learning point was Daniel chapter 1. It hit me hard. I loved my meat. I used to eat meat every day. Without meat, I don't eat food. That's <laughs> what I used to do. That's what I used to do. 2006, I this Daniel chapter 1 hit me left, right, and center. And I said, Lord, I think you're the same God, aren't you? Okay, now, I can't give this up. You, you, you better take control. And that's when... God took control and took that off. And then I started testing this God. Any doubt I had, I asked him. I want evidence. So sometimes I'll be thinking of something and I'm not sure. I'm, I, I want to have that faith that I can make that decision. I would pray and ask, Lord, okay, I want to ask somebody. I want to, I'm still a sinful human being. Strength, you have to strengthen me. Help my unbelief. That's what the Bible tells. So I said, okay, you, uh, I want to ask somebody and that somebody should give me the answer. Not you talking to me in my conscience. I, I'm really, I'm practically, I understand what I'm saying. So this mm -hmm. is what I did all this all along until now. I don't care. I move. So I would pray and I said, um, and the Lord puts somebody's... Uh, a name in your mind. And I said, okay, this name you put in my mind. I'm going to ask this person. And the, once I finish my prayer, I pick up the phone. I call that person. I'm going to ask you a question. Give me an answer. Yes, sir. No, that's all. Don't. Afterwards, you aren't any questions. You ask, I'll answer. But first, answer my question with yes or no. <laughs> so I ask the question. I get the answer. And I said, thank you very much. Okay. If you want to know why I asked you the question, I'll tell you. And I tell you. Whatever answer I got from the person is what I did. 
we don't test God enough. We don't trust God enough. We don't believe what the God has written for us enough. I'm telling you, this, this was my experience. You have to build that faith and trust in God so that you can now blindly say, okay, I'm going. That's how we both could quit our jobs. Just imagine. How will we survive? Jobless, homeless. Mm. Well, um, there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, um, Hilton, yes? there's a question in the chat. Have you yes. seen it? Yeah. Uh, yes, I was just coming to that. Thank you for reminding me. So we have a question from um, Attila. And the question to you, Brother Robert, um, do you do more country living presentations? And, and she's really commenting on many of the things that you have said, returning to Eden state in occupation as a gardener, in diet, in raw plant-based diet, a return to a state where we were made in God's image and enjoyed face-to-face -face communion with him. And there is also a question that she proposed um, and SDAs supposed to stay in the city to minister to the unsaved living there. So shall I answer the last one? Yes, please. Be okay. Yes. Okay. Supposed to is not a right to expression to use that. If God has called somebody to minister in the cities, yes. We cannot use that as an excuse to stay in the cities. And six days do your own things and seventh day go to church. You understand what I'm saying? If God has called you to minister in the cities and is the, that's the only thing you are doing, I believe God will keep you there, preserve you there, and send you to somewhere that he has placed and prepared a place for you to flee in the time of trouble in the countryside. And that is why the admonition for those who move to the countryside is not to be selfish and prepare for themselves, but to prepare for those that God will send to them in the time of trouble. And those are those who will be working in the cities, not those who are lagging their feet, dragging their feet, and just trying to live their lives. And then time of trouble hits. Oh, where shall we go now? No, not for them. Sorry, I'm very straight and open. That's what I believe and understand. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I, I think we covered the first question. Um, do you do more con country living presentations? I want to say one thing on that. I don't do so much on country living presentations online uh, per se, but when people ask me to do, I do them. So it might be fine on their social media, so to say, but uh, not so much on our website, Prophecy Life. But I want to say one thing. We're proposing to have a camp meeting of real time, what you do when you move to the country, what you should be doing, how you should do them, and all those practical things. We're planning a camp here, May 31st to June 3rd in Wales here, on one of the properties of one person who moved to the countryside. He was on Journey Planet too, Jared and Shirley. On their property, we're planning a camp meeting. Now, this is not going to be in chalets and Airbnb and all know. You have to pitch tent. You have to come down to understand how it is going to be in the time of trouble. So we're going to give a practical experience in that camp. It's just over the weekend. You come Friday afternoon, you leave Monday morning, at May 31st to June 3rd. And what all you would do once you move to the country, what you will do, how you will do, how to do and things like that, even hands-on. For those who have never done those things, Practical training also will be there. So that's what we are planning. And if you all want to come, you all can come. All right. Thank you very much. And keep us posted and updated as the time draws. Yeah, we, we, we may send you a poster to put on your uh, web as well. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Well, we want to express our appreciation and gratitude for you coming on yet again and sharing um, these powerful messages. Again, those of you who would like more information, you can go to prophecylive.org, and that is P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y-L-I-V-E.org. Yeah. Um, Brother Robert, can we invite you to pray us out, please? Sure. Let us pray. 
merciful, kind and loving father seated in the most holy place. And yes, you look down upon earth, especially upon your people who are called by name. Give us grace, O Lord, and forgive us if we have fallen short of your glory. Help us to seek your leading of the Holy Spirit to direct us in every thought, word and action. So that while we live our lives here on planet Earth, that we would be your witnesses in all that we do and say. Be with those who are making the choices that they need to make in preparation for the times that are ahead of us that you have revealed. The time of trouble is knocking at the door. And many people have to make their decisions and choices to move or not to move. So direct their thoughts to seek your direction for each individual, whether they stay where they stay or where they ought to move and how they have to move and with whom they have to move and things that are needed to be done. So direct the thoughts of each one under the hearing of your words. Thank you for this privilege that we can strengthen and encourage one another in this great controversy to finish the work and to be prepared to go with thee when the comest in the clouds of heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again for blessing us with your wealth of knowledge and the Spirit of God continue to bless you as you minister to souls in wherever he sends you. Sure. God bless you. Um, we want to wish you very ho happy holidays. Those of you who um, uh, are going to be, well, maybe not celebrating, but happy holidays when it comes. We want to remind you that this is our final and last broadcast for the year. We, we resume broadcasting on the 6th of January, 2024. May God continue to bless you. May he lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace in your hearts and home. See you in the new year. Thank you again for watching the Journey Planner SDA. Remember to subscribe, like, and share the links to our YouTube and Facebook broadcasts. See you at the next episode.